All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Lissy from Family Shrinks Network, and hopefully you're here for our speaker series on self-care with Laura Lockwood. Thank you so much, Laura, for agreeing to talk with everybody. I think, as you can see by the screen, everybody needs a little self-care. <laughs> All right, so take it away whenever you're ready, Laura. Okay, well, I'm super excited about this. I'm super excited about all of the interest as well. And um, this is something I do as part of my profession, but I believe that everybody can benefit and needs to um, make self-care a priority. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I just moved to Los Alamos less than 18 months ago and have started my own private practice. And I am trained in dialectical behavioral therapy and self-soothing is part of the emotion regulation um, compartment of dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, also, as I do presentations, I much prefer um, discussion and dialogue and going back and forth rather than lecture. So please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, um, and just chime in. I'm gonna start out with a question and I want um, each of you to participate and tell me what's on your plate right now? What, what stresses you out or maybe it doesn't stress you out, but what are your responsibilities? I'll kick it off since I'm, you know, the one officially running it. Um, I have a preschooler or pre yeah preschooler who has sensory issues and today is the very first t-ball practice and I'm terrified of how that's gonna go <laughs> so that's that's my biggest stressor at the moment <laughs> what else do you have on your plate Lissy um I acquire jobs like like it's a like it's a hobby apparently I I work do like little part-time things for a bunch of different stuff so I've got my FSN job I work with the steam lab um I have another kiddo um who has an IEP and so we have all kinds of stuff with his schooling and I think the rest of the stuff is good stuff not not that that's not good is is stuff that I've chosen <laughs> Well, who else? Shout them out to me. Just start naming off what you're right. looking for. Thank you. <clears throat> to keep myself organized, because I do have four children, four grandchildren, a husband who travels, FSN. You get the picture. I print mine off every day. Yes. That's great. That's, it's on the computer so that I have to worry about fewer things at one point. Good. <laughs> Good. Who else? I'll go. Um, my name is Jeremy, and I am a single mom of a 13-year-old as well. Um, I'm not his biological mom, but I do have a two-year-old that I've raised since he was two weeks old. So I have my hand full with two kids, and also I have three dogs. So I try to keep organized and try to keep it all together, but I'm definitely in need of some self-care. Okay. Kate in the comments says work, school, kids, parents, extended family. And right now she's recovering from her second COVID shot, which I'm so glad that they're available, but man, did that kick my booty too. So. I'm assuming most of us have a laundry list of things that we have to tackle every single day. And if not every single week and we're very, very busy. Um, how often do you take time to take care of yourself? And some of us may be doing this without even thinking about it. Um, for example, if we exercise every day, that definitely goes on the self-care list. Um, and so I want you to think about your life and the amount of time you spend on all of your responsibilities versus the amount of time you spend taking care of yourself. 
Um, I don't know how many of you saw the, the little advertisement for, for today's discussion, but I often use the comparison of a teapot and teacups. And if we are the teapot and all of our responsibilities, such as children and jobs and the household, laundry, cooking, grocery shopping, you get the idea, are our teacups we are responsible to fill those teacups every day. And if we never take time to refill the teapot, we will eventually crash and burn. We won't be able to maintain all of the things that we are responsible for in our lives. And so it's really a key component. Sometimes people feel like, well, that's selfish um, or I don't have time for that. I have too much else going on. You'll pay for it eventually if you don't take time to what I call self-soothe. Um, so anybody, sh well, we'll get to that in a minute. A couple of things to keep in mind before we really dig into ways to self-soothe. Um, again, in DBT, uh, they have what's called the police skill, which basically goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves physically in order to be um, in a good place emotionally and mentally. And so we wanna start by making sure we get plenty of sleep, good nutrition, exercise. Whenever we have a physical need that is not being met, we're more vulnerable to our emotions. So something to remember, whenever we have a physical need that is not being met. We are more vulnerable to our emotions. And, you know, this makes a lot of sense when you think about children and what they're like when they get tired or when they're hungry. Really, we're the same way as adults. We just learn how to control ourselves. But we need to make sure that our physical needs are being addressed first. Okay. Let's dig in. The research shows that people who self-soothe every day struggle less with anxiety and depression. So not only is it a coping skill, but it's a preventative skill. It's a way to keep ourselves out of anxiety and depression. Um, so let's brainstorm. And this is something I do with clients. Um, not always, but most of the time at some point in a session, self-soothing will come up and I will actually have them write down a self-soothing list. So if you have pen and paper handy, you might want to write down your own self-soothing list as we brainstorm. Now, as we brainstorm, I want you all to unmute and just shout out ideas of ways that you self-soothe, what you do to take care of yourself. I'll start. So just this morning, right now, I'm wearing my comfy slippers. I'm in my office with my diffuser going with deep blue doTERRA essential oils. Um, I made myself some blueberry herbal tea that I'm sipping and I'm in my very comfortable office. So those are just simple three, four different ways that I'm self-soothing right now. Okay, give me yours. Music. Yes. For me, it's music. Music is powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that right off the bat. Music um, can be one of the most powerful ways to self-soothe. There is a warning that comes with that. We tend to gravitate to music that accentuates the mood we're already in. So you wanna be aware of that. And if the mood you're already in, you're trying to change, then you want to intentionally pick music that's going to change that. Whether you're feeling high, strung, overwhelmed, anxious, and so you need a relaxing playlist, or you're feeling kind of sluggish and unmotivated and you need an energizing playlist. Music is one of the quickest ways I know of to change a mood. Thank you. What else? Sunshine. Go ahead, Kate. Sunshine. Yes, sunshine. And we're gonna talk more about that. Um, 
getting outside nature. Um, I loved Ohio. I love Ohio. It's beautiful. It's green, but we didn't get a whole lot of sunshine. And that is, that's probably my favorite thing about living in New Mexico. And I'm, I'm very mindful of it. We'll talk about mindfulness in a minute as well. Um, because I'm not used to getting a lot of it. Well, I am now because I've, I've lived here for 18 months, but I love sunshine. Rachel. Oh, I like to take baths when I'm super stressed, like a nice lavender salt bath, maybe some calm music, no kids anywhere near. That really helps. Good. Good. I love it. And you brought up a lot of points, which again is touching on mindfulness. Um, not, it wasn't just a simple bath. You know, you've got bath salts, maybe some music going, lighting. It, any time that we can self-soothe and involve all of our senses, we're going to get more out of that experience. Yes. So baths. What else? My, my thing that I, one concrete thing that I do for myself is I joined the roller derby league. So it's athletics, it's moving my body, it's doing hard things, things that are pushing me a little bit. And it is like my favorite socialization of the whole week. And so it's like being around people I love and who root for me. I love it. Tell me a little bit more about that. How do you roller derby here? Is there a <laughs> team? We, we have a league. There's, um, we skate at the ice rink um, when there's not ice. And so, yeah. So right now we're not actually able to play, but we're skating. And so it's just, you know, moving our body and using, using muscles and being, being strong and taking up space is kind of our theme. Uh -huh. Love it. Who else? Well, two of my favorites are needlework and listening to mindful tapes that kind of lull you. Okay. And where do you get your mindful tapes? They're on my Fitbit. <laughs> Good. Uh, really relaxes one. Good. Who else? Ginger, well, before, you Did someone else have a comment? Um, I was going to say before COVID, it was getting together with my girlfriends, but that's kind of taken a back seat during COVID. So that's been harder. It is hard. COVID has been interesting. <laughs> it's changed our lives in a lot of ways. Some, some I think are good ways and some that are much harder and socialization obviously is much harder. Have you found any ways around that, Christy? Um, yes, there have been a couple of times we've done Zoom calls, but with every meeting being on Zoom, it gets like at the beginning of COVID, it was easier and now it's more of a hassle it, it's not necessarily a hassle it's just harder I think um and it's harder to get everybody together but I my best friend lives in my neighborhood and so we you know walk by each other's houses and and say hi from afar kind of thing um and we've gotten we've been able to get together after quarantining for a little while um, and become like a little pod. So that has helped, but I really haven't seen very many friends at all. So, oh. yeah, that's been a hard, a hard side effect to this whole COVID thing for sure. So Laura, I was thinking back, um, I feel like my lists are different for self-care now than when my kids were younger. Um, and I probably wouldn't work right now, but yard selling was a huge thing for me living here. When my kids were little, I could get up on a Saturday morning. Mike was home. You saw people you knew. So you were socializing. Um, 
And so that worked for me. Um, now I, I'm really trying to learn Spanish. <laughs> So it might not sound self-soothing, but I make time every day to spend a little time on that. Good, good. I'm impressed. So um, yeah, there are things on our self-soothing list that could fall under the category of achievement. For example, cleaning house. Actually, I've discovered later since my kids are gone, I, I actually enjoy the act of cleaning my house. But before I would have said, it's just the feeling I enjoy when I'm done and how it feels. But that can go on the self-soothing list. For some people, exercise is that way. Um, they don't really enjoy it while they're doing it, but they feel really good about themselves when they're done. I actually enjoy the act of exercising as well. Um, I used to walk, um, around here, which was a challenge moving from Ohio, which was not flat, but not like here and, um, it, not as high elevation, obviously, but then I got a hip injury and I thought, Oh, I'm going to, for me, exercise is so important for my mental health. I can tell a difference when I'm not exercising. And so I decided to take advantage of the aquatic center, which is an amazing resource we have here in this community. And I deep water run, not really a swimmer. And I'd rather not get my hair wet every day or wear a swim cap. So I just wear a flotation device. And I literally go through the motion of running in water that's over my head. So the swimmers are lapping me but I'm, my heart rate is up and um, it's something that I enjoy and find very soothing. Anybody else love to exercise? And if so, what do you do? I love to exercise, but I like high intensity interval training, which probably I wouldn't have loved five years ago. Five years ago, I liked yoga because that's where I was at. And in 10 years, my body may not be able to handle that. But right now I love to do something that looks so hard and that I can barely do it. But at the end, I feel very accomplished. So that's a couple of examples, Rachel. All right. Well, let's see this morning. I, I usually use beach body because I can just turn it on here since COVID started. That's what I've been doing. Um, so uh, she'll give me a set of like, today it was, it was lifting weights. So we were doing arm cool curls and hammers and, um, uh, push-ups and oh man I cannot do all those push-ups and um but like yesterday I was doing a more cardio which was things like burpees and lunges and jumps and yeah stuff like that so yeah you go girl and you do that while you're young and you still can yeah exactly right and yeah. like I said it's it's a right now thing but I also love hiking that's really fun to me good who else I love yoga um, and I was a member of two yoga studios in Ohio where they offered hot yoga. And I am so missing that here. Um, there's a hot yoga called Thrive in Santa Fe and I thought about trying it out, but then COVID hit and there's so many restrictions and I don't think I could do it in a mask. But yoga fills a lot of needs, not only um, exercise, getting your heart rate up, strength and strength training and flexibility, but it's a mindful activity. And again, we'll talk about mindfulness in just a minute. Um, there's a Thrive here in town. Um, I don't know if they're doing hot yoga, but Krista Tyson um, teaches yoga. She's amazing. She does it at Thrive and she does it at Pete. Um, she's an incredible yoga instructor. But I don't know if they're, we used to have a Bikram yoga, but that went away years ago. So I'm not sure if there's a hot one, but we do have awesome yoga here in town, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Krista Tyson. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So as part of DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, one of the things that, that Marsha Linehan talks about is pleasant events. That's what she terms self-soothing activities. And she has a list of 250 ways to self-soothe. 
So we have barely hit the tip of the iceberg. Anybody holding back of anything else that you do to self-soothe? I'm generally a really social person, but I do definitely need my alone time. Mm -hmm. Me too. This is really strange, but ironing is very soothing. Okay. Why do you think that is, Nancy? I think it's the warmth. Okay. I hadn't thought of that. Again, so taking in your senses. <laughs> but, but not everyone's <laughs> into this. <laughs> But, but in, a, in a disaster time, you'll find me ironing. Okay. <laughs> like some people pace, you iron. I, I, I don't know why exactly, but it, it is comforting. When you're accomplishing something, like at the end, you have a finished product. You, you have ironed this, you know, thing. So I can see the, the comfort of doing it and the, like, accomplishment I, at the end a little bit. I think it's more sensory than... <laughs> 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 and for me, it's kind of mindless. And sometimes it's nice to do something mindless. It's not so challenging. Um, so that's what I was thinking of when you said that's self-soothing for you. Art. Do I have any artists here? I see. Rachel. Oh, drawing or painting or looking at art. Um, those are ways to self-soothe. Oh, Kate, I wanted to ask you, you like your alone time. What does that look like? Like, kind of depends on, um, you know, the situation and, and what I feel I need. I tend to go for walks because um, I said sunshine earlier, but tend to go for walks or hikes. Um, that don't involve interaction, but I also enjoy those things when they do. Um, even sometimes just going, especially lately, going somewhere alone in the car, like to go run errands or something and just, you know, turn on whatever I want to listen to. And um, but yeah, there's, I guess there's not really a specific thing I like to do alone. I just know that I've learned that about myself over the years that if I don't get that time in, I tend to, like you were saying earlier, that physical needs um, are, you know, impact our emotional needs. And I've definitely noticed over the years that if I don't get that alone time in, then I have a um, less patience and I'm more high strung and all of that kind of stuff. I can completely relate. Um, especially when I was raising kids, when my kids were at home, I needed that alone time and yes, <laughs> just getting in the car, and going somewhere alone. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, uh, I have a few more that I could add and I'm, I'm apologies for not being able to mute and turn my phone off at the same time a minute ago. Did not mean to interrupt things. Um, yard work. I love yard work. I always call it um, cheap therapy, um, and reading. And I'm especially happy if my family will let me read to them. <laughs> so for me, you cut out, um, reading yard work. Is that what you shared? Yeah, just, I think those were the two hammock time, which kind of falls in the yard too, and usually follows heavy yard work. So maybe that's why I like yard work. <laughs> For me, it's a double-edged sword because I need that quiet time too, but it comes at the okay. expense of sleep because the only time I really get it is once everybody's in bed, which means I'm up till one in the morning. And then I, once I have that quiet time, <laughs> then it's, I can relax and go to sleep. But in, until yeah. everybody else is, is done and in bed and gone. And that's when I, I'm a night owl. So that's when I get my work done. And then I, you know, 
that's my scroll time when I can get on the internet and scroll and read articles and whatever, but it's hard to like sit down and read a book right now because I feel like I get distracted way too many times throughout the day. So quiet evening time is my time. Okay. Yep. Books, movies kind of fall under the same category. They're an opportunity to kind of escape and go somewhere else. Um, yes, good, good. So this list I was referring to contains a lot of um, sports, different sports, um, and things that, that might be self-soothing to one person may not be self-soothing to someone else. Uh, the very first thing on the list I've always found funny is working on her car. Um, and so, you know, we've mentioned a lot of things that don't cost any money that are very easy to incorporate and maybe don't take very much time. We can also um, add vacations to that list. You know, of course, when I was raising kids, vacation was kind of a mixed bag. It was a little bit of self-soothing, but it was a lot of bit of work as well. Um, one of the things I do for myself now well, I was faithful in Ohio. I got a massage every month. When I moved here, massages are more expensive here. And so I had to really evaluate that. And I didn't get any for a while, partly due to COVID. And then I found someone whom I love, more expensive. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do it every six weeks. And the last time I went, I said, no, I'm going to do it every month. So I, I really do value a good massage. Um, any other ideas before we move away from the brainstorming? This is, this is weird, but I kind of realized just suddenly talking about this, realized that this is one of the things that I do. I take the long route home after dropping my kids off and I play Pokemon Go, <laughs> stop at a bunch of different places and catch some Pokemon and do so just a little quiet time in the car, something that's not related to anybody but me. <laughs> Good. I think I was hoping it was someone else's internet trouble, but I think I might be having internet trouble. You guys are all cutting in and out. So please let me know if you can't hear or um, if I'm cutting in and out for you. So uh, a couple things, there's a difference between avoiding and distracting and self-soothing, healthy self-soothing is a way to distract. Um, once when I was running a group about this, a guy said, how much self-soothing is too much, which I thought was a weird question. And then I realized he was talking about playing video games and his wife complained that he played video games too much. So when we're self-soothing, we're distracting, we're unwinding, so to speak. We're not avoiding responsibilities, um, but it's important that we schedule it into our day. Now, we've talked a little bit about mindfulness. Anybody here want to take a stab at what mindfulness means to you? So mindfulness is, is really being aware and paying attention. The pure form of mindfulness is paying, aware, paying attention to the present moment. We're often in the future in our thoughts, which can invite anxiety. Those thoughts start with what if, what if I'm late? What if I'm underdressed? What if they don't like me? What if my internet cuts out in this presentation? And those kind of thoughts invite anxiety. When we go to the past in our thoughts, we tend to invite depression. Um, either we have regrets, we wish we would have said or done something differently, or we long for a better time, a time that we look back on with nostalgia and wish things were like that. And so being in the present moment is neutral. And so it's a very healthy thing to practice mindfulness. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. Yoga is one way that we've already talked about, um, uh, meditation tapes like Nancy talked about. Um, so in order for self-soothing or taking care of ourselves to be a maximum benefit, we need to be mindful. So if we run this bubble bath and we get the scents going in a candle and we have some chocolate and some lighting 
and we're sitting in there stewing about an argument we just had, we're counteracting the positive effects of that, of that self-soothing activity. Just like walking outside, um, being a part of nature, we could be in our head and rehashing a conversation that we had and miss all of the benefits of the sights and the sounds and the smells of being outside in nature. And so it's really important to be intentional about our self-soothing and to soak it in, to take it in with all of our five senses. <clears throat> now this, this part that I wanted to talk about does not come from my training in dialectical behavioral therapy. And some of you may have seen this on Facebook recently, but I, it really spoke to me. Um, basically it's saying that sleep and rest are not the same thing. And we often confuse the two when we're tired, we're overwhelmed. We think, or, and this, it could be true that we lack sleep, but sleep is just one area of our life that we need to make sure we're monitoring and taking care of. Um, and so the article that I saw on Facebook goes through all the different areas of rest that we need. Um, and she talks about seven key areas of restoration. The first one is physical rest, which is sleeping, napping. She calls those passive. But she, there are also ways that we can actively physically rest. And she mentions yoga, stretching, and massage therapy. And I remember, I love massages. And I remember one time going to a restorative yoga class and restorative yoga is where they use a lot of props and it's really relaxation. It's not so much strengths and, and flexibility. And I remember after, I can't remember if it was 60 minutes or 90 minutes, leaving that class, feeling the same way I feel after I've gotten a massage. And that really impacted me that, wow, there's different ways to acquire this high level of endorphins, if you will. So um, it's not just sleep. That, I also have a favorite yoga instructor who was in Ohio and I followed her some online, who talks about how it's okay to miss an hour of sleep to fill that time with an hour of yoga. Your body will get the same benefits, which I thought was interesting. So physical rest, and I think it's, I think it's symbolic that that's number one. Number two is mental rest. And she recommends taking short breaks throughout the day, like every two hours to remind you to slow down and to remind you to disconnect. Uh, she also suggests keeping a notepad by your bed to jot down nagging thoughts that might keep you awake. Number three is sensory rest. Bright lights, computer screens, background noise, um, Zoom calls or in an office, these can cause our senses to get overwhelmed. This can be countered by doing something as simple as closing your eyes um, for, the, for a minute in the middle of the day, as well as intentionally unplugging from electronics at the end of every day. Intentional moments of sensory deprivation can begin to undo the damage inflicted by our overstimulating world. Um, and mindfulness is something that in order to be effective and to be used um, throughout your day, you have to practice. And, but once you incorporate that as a habit, one or two minutes in the middle of the day can really significantly help you regroup and restore. Number four, creative rest. This type of rest is especially important for anyone who must solve problems or brainstorm new ideas. Creative rest reawakens the awe and wonder inside each of us. Do you recall the first time you saw the Grand Canyon or the ocean or a waterfall? Allowing yourself to take in the beauty of the outdoors, even if it's at a local park or in your backyard, provides you with creative rest. 
which I thought was interesting because I don't consider myself an artist. I'm not artistic, um, but I do appreciate art. And I have felt it many times restore my soul. Um, so that's another piece of it, not only nature, but art itself. I understand we have um, an art museum here near Fuller, Lar Fuller Lodge. Has anybody been there? Can you tell me about it? I've been there. Um, this is small and it's somewhat of a uh, rotating level of art. They will have a theme and different representations of that theme will be displayed. Uh, they're normally art, I mean, normally local artists. Um, I really, I have always enjoyed it. Sometimes it will be uh, a traditional art. Sometimes it could be fiber arts. It could be, um, I also really appreciate that our community uh, encourages one artist I happen to know personally who lives in the group home for mentally challenged. And I just think that it is so cool that he is represented in that way. That is neat. But, but I would, it's not gonna take you long because it is, it is small, but, but it, it feels good. Good, thank you. It's also a gift shop. So if you want a unique little gift, um, they've got beautiful jewelry and, and other pieces of art that you can buy. Cool. Thank you. You know, we often think of art as physical things, but art is also music. Um, and I missed out on the concerts at Ashley Pond because I moved here three months before COVID and they didn't happen last year. I understand that they're supposed to happen at least at the beginning virtually this summer. Anybody have information about that? I think they're waiting, they're, they're doing some virtual and then they're, they're hoping to be able to do in person, but kind of waiting to see what the situation is like when it's a little closer is what I understood. There are gonna be, there are some live music things happening at Bathtub Row though. Um, a friend of mine, I think this next month is doing their first live performance in like a year and a half. Cool. At Bathtub Row. Good. One when, thing I love, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say when things do get back to normal, also in the summers on Tuesday nights, our local artists, their little smaller venue, but always pretty cool to go to at the pond. Cool. That's one thing I love about Los Alamos is the sense of community that I even can feel during COVID. Um, I've never lived in such a small town and I didn't think I would like it, but I do love that feeling of community um, that we have here. Um, okay, let's continue on. The next one is, well, I think it goes under social rest. Um, think about a friend that you might have, everyone thinks is the nicest person they've ever met. And it's the person everyone depends on, the one you call if you need a favor, because even if they don't want to do it, you know they'll say yes. But when this friend is alone, they may feel unappreciated and depleted. And so an important part of taking care of ourselves is setting boundaries. One way to think about this for people who have a hard time setting boundaries is anytime you say yes to something, you are automatically saying no to other things because you're committing to the, your time to that thing that you're saying yes to. So that's one way to remember it so you don't feel selfish when setting boundaries and saying no. You want to be able to protect your family and your own space and time. And that requires balance. And sometimes that's hard to figure out what that means for you, but it's okay to say no when you need to say no. One of the things Brene Brown says 
is boundaries keep us out of resentment. And I love that. I'll say it again. Boundaries keep us out of resentment. Sometimes, and I've caught myself doing the same thing. We say yes when we want to say no and we do it, but we have a feeling of resentment inside. And that's not healthy for us or the person who we said healthy, who we said yes to. Um, emotional rest. Emotional rest means having the time and space to freely express your feelings and cut back on people pleasing. So that kind of goes with this. Emotional rest also requires the courage to be authentic. If someone says, how are you today? That you're able to truthfully say, I'm really not okay and to share things that typically go unsaid. Now, not every time someone asks you how you're doing, are they seeking for an honest answer? Sometimes we use it in our culture as just a greeting. But if you're with someone close, you wanna be able to share how you're truly feeling. Social rest, if you're in need of emotional rest, you probably have a social rest deficit. This occurs when we fail to differentiate between those relationships that revive us and those relationships that exhaust us. To experience more social rest, we need to surround ourselves with positive and supportive people. Even if interactions have to occur virtually, we can choose to engage more fully in them by turning on our camera and focus on, focusing on who we're with. This is part of being mindful too, it's being present. One of the things I say is be where your feet are. So if, if you're in a meeting, be in that meeting. If you are interacting with a child, be with that child. Comes back to being mindful and paying attention to the present moment of where you are right now. And then finally, spiritual rest. Spiritual rest is the ability to connect beyond the physical and mental and feel a deep sense of belonging, love, acceptance, and purpose. To receive this, engage in something greater than yourself, add prayer, meditation, or community involvement in your daily routine. And I think of this as um, service as a part of this. Oftentimes, if we can get outside of ourself, outside of our own problem in immediate family and serve someone else, there is a real sense of um, peace and self-soothing that comes along with that. So those ideas can also be on your self-soothing list. Again, it's gotta be something that you choose to do, not something that you feel um, compelled to do in order to count as self-soothing. And then the very last thing I have to talk about is gratitude. Again, going back to Brene Brown, whom I love, she talks about how gratitude leads to joy. There is a direct connection between gratitude and joy. <clears throat> Does anybody have any ways that they can share of how they try to be grateful, try to keep gratitude in the forefront of their mind? I have two things. I think number one is that in our family, we maybe even overdo the gratitude sometimes, but you know, it puffs each other up and helps us feel good and helps us recognize when another family member has done something kind or thoughtful, you know, for us or, or excuse me, or for someone else in the family. Um, and then the other thing, I've never been much of a journaler because I always was not really sure if I was doing it right. <laughs> and um, I was re recently given a book that has just tiny little prompts and it's a gratitude journal. And they just have like, every day has four different prompts of, you know, something that I can see right now that I'm thankful for, or someone I, you know, haven't seen in a while that I want to show gratitude to or something like that. So it only takes about you know, a couple minutes to do it, but I've actually been working it in my routine a lot more often 
lately. And it's, it's been really fun just to see, you know, I get excited to see what the prompts are for tomorrow, where I get excited to look back through it and, and kind of rehash my thoughts of where I was. And especially on those days when I'm not feeling particularly happy or grateful or joyful. Um, it's fun to look through and just kind of makes it, makes it feel more real. Like, okay, this is just one moment that's going to pass because look at all these other moments that I've had recently that I wasn't feeling, you know, down or sad or whatever. I love that. I love the idea of your book. Would love to get that resource, but you brought out a lot of good points of, of being grateful and focusing on gratitude is it kind of shifts your mindset. It shifts your focus even throughout the day. So journaling is something that I, I will work on with clients and I encourage them to write three things every day that they're grateful for. And I tell them you can write the same three things, but you have to feel it when you write it. You can't just end and and, 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 and you're done. No, you have to, if you, if you're grateful for the sunshine every single day, that's fine. You can write that as one of your three, but you have to really think about it and feel it. The other thing that Kate kind of brought out is when we are keeping a gratitude journal, then we will look for things throughout the day that we can write in our list the next day. And so it really does guide our focus and help us to remember to be grateful and look for the good things in, in our lives. Even when life is hard, there's always something to be grateful for. And personally, I have found when I get started on writing three things I'm grateful for, it's just a bullet list. It might just be three words, but then I want to expound. I want to write why I'm grateful for that and how it makes me feel. And then my gratitude journal ends up being more uh, paragraph form and, and more rich, filled with feeling. And so even if you feel like, okay, my plate is too full, I cannot add writing three things I'm grateful for. If you will make an effort to notice three things you're grateful for every day, it will shift your mindset overall. And you will notice that you will feel more joy throughout your day. We kind of do something like that, but not, it's not just gratitude. Um, in the evenings, and it, and it bounces back and forth. Sometimes it's every day that we do it, we'll get in a, and um, going really well. And then we'll get in a rut and it's, you know, a couple times a week, but the kids, um, at dinner, we say what well, our rose, our thorn, and our leaf is. And our rose is our gratitude, and our thorn is something that we didn't like that happened or something we saw we didn't like. And then the leaf is something that we've learned to help us grow. Um, and the kids <laughs> really love doing that. Um, and I got to a point, especially when they were young, well, they were a little younger. I've gotten out of it, and I need to get back to it when they fight because my kids are great, but they fight like cats and dogs with each other sometimes. And so when they're really in this rut of just kind of picking on each other, I make them sit down and talk, say three things that they love about the other person. And it kind of helps stop and break that and changes their mindset. Um, and I notice as adults, we're not doing that, but I make the kids do it. So it's kind of a do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> which, which we should be doing that as adults too, just trying to change our mindset. Um, but it really does help with the kids uh, to get them to change to that gratitude mindset. I love that. And I've, I've also used that with clients, but I haven't heard the leaf part. So I, I encourage them to do thorns and roses every night at dinner around the dinner table to get conversation going to, and also as parents to learn about how our kids day went and so your roses are the best things that happened to you that day. And your thorns are the worst things that happened to you that day. But I'm going to start including the leaf. I love that of maybe what you learned that day. Um, yeah. And so it gets you out of a mindset. It, you know, from a counseling standpoint, I would say it also validates by being able to talk about the hard things and maybe getting some support, but also 
you know, focusing on, okay, I'm going to have to share at least something that was good. What can I share that happened to me today? And then get your mind thinking along those lines. So I guess just in closing, I would encourage you to make your own self-soothing list. Really brainstorm what speaks to you. Shopping, maybe online shopping, music, um, being out in the sun, whatever it is, laughing, watching a funny show that makes you laugh. Um, and keep that list handy so that when you're having a down day, you can, and nothing, nothing sounds appealing and you're like, eh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. You can pull out your self-soothing list and make yourself do something off the list. That's a different skill. That's called opposite action. And the research shows that motivation follows action. And so even though we may not feel like doing it, if we will do it, it, it will change the mood um, that we're feeling and experiencing inside of ourselves. So that's all I have, unless there's another question or comments. Thank you so much. I think I, we, I, the, the gratefulness reminds me of when Chit Chat was starting back when, and, and Tara, who ran the Chit Chat program that I'm kind of running now, um, would have us do introductions and three things we were grateful for. And so many times all of us were like, Oh, you have to come up with things. And then, you know, wouldn't you know it like a month later, we're like on the drive over, we're like, okay, what are my gratefuls going to be today? <laughs> and uh, I think we need to, once we can be around people for real again, we need to get back into that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kate and Christy remember back in the day when, when we started all that. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have anything before we, before we end? I just wanted to make a quick comment about what Laura said about how it grows too. And Lissy, you kind of touched on it too, that um, when we first started doing kind of gratitude stuff with the kids, it was always the same thing, you know, my mom, my dad, and my dog, or, you know, some, something very topical or surface, I guess. And then like now that we've been doing it for a while and they're kind of in the habit and, and they have, I guess, grown in that way. Um, it is kind of cool to see the different things that they come up with. And it's, it's a little glimpse into, you know, like Christy said, how their day was or how, you know, what's going on, but it's also like, oh, I didn't have any idea that that thing that so-and-so did for you was so impactful for you. So I think it's, it's kind of twofold in that. And I, I like that. I used to tell the kids before school, um, grow your brain, have fun and be kind. Those were the three things I told them before they went to school every day. And we got into a place where every day I would say, okay, I want you to do one kind thing for somebody. And then at the dinner table, we would talk about what that thing was. Um, and it just kind of set the mindset for, for looking um, at things you can do. And then that, that act would bring joy to them as well. Um, and so, yeah, just, I don't know. I, th I think that brings me joy is seeing them try to be good citizens too. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to comment that um, I think you've said a couple times, Laura, during this that you really have to be present and actually mentally there when you do these self-soothing things. Because um, I'm looking back on the times when, you know, exercise was really good and I really enjoyed it and I got a lot of like emotional release out of it. And other times like this morning where I was so focused on what I needed to do after I was done working out that I wasn't even there really. Um, and I think that's true for everything, whether you're talking to your kids or, um, 
doing something relaxing or doing something challenging, if you get distracted, it just takes the quality of your life down a lot. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and participating. I think we learn more when we contribute and I feel more synergy than when I lecture. So thank you for all the comments. Thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us, Laura. This has been awesome. And I, I agree. I think we, one thing that that we always say in Derby is ask all the people for their words because somebody's words will speak to you. Um, and so I love the having everybody chime in has, it gives us different words and, and they all, somebody's words will work for you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna hit the stop button. Can you put the, um...